we've been looking at the authority and the power and the glory of the name of Jesus Christ. Okay, if you've got your Bible, go to the go to the book of Romans, chapter one. If you have your Bible, just hold it up in the air. If you've got a Bible today, if you have it on your phone, great. If you've got it on a tablet, if you've got your phone, don't use your phone for texting. Let that wait for later. You know, send texts later. Don't do that now. Let's focus. Give our attention to what the Word of God has to speak. So Romans chapter 1 verse 5. Romans chapter 1 verse 5. And the Apostle Paul says, Through him, but through Jesus, we have received grace and apostleship for the obedience of faith among all nations. For his name. For his name, say for his name, amongst whom you also are called by Jesus Christ. So what is this sin? When the, when the Bible mentions the term the nations or the term the Gentiles, it means those who are outside, outside of the covenant. Now I don't want to lose people if you're new. God has a relate. God relates to people through covenant. He relates to people through covenant. Marriage is a covenant. Okay, marriage for for example, marriage between a man and a woman is a covenant. God calls people to Himself into a covenant. The Christian faith is a covenant. Specifically, it is a blood covenant. It is a covenant of blood. In the blood of Jesus Christ. And so, the Bible makes a distinction. Essentially, those who are in the covenant and those who are outside. Now, the Word of God does not take a, a view of contempt. On those outside. All are invited. Every single kind of person. Every race. Every background. Every colour. Every kind of person. Through the message of the gospel. Through the message of the cross. Through the blood of Jesus. Is invited into the covenant. Okay now. In the New Testament time. You had people from a Jewish background who were believers in Jesus. And they, those people, had a mindset and an understanding of what it was to be God's covenant people. To live in a covenant relationship with God. Others who came from a pagan background had no concept of covenant. Okay, now when we understand covenant, it, it, it clears a lot up. When you know you have a covenant with God, it eliminates your insecurity, your fear, your inadequacy. Because God has condescended himself in the person of his son to shed blood to invoke a covenant. And invite you into it. Okay. Now we could ask the question. If God is a God of love. Why do terrible things happen to people? Now listen. God loves all people. God loves all people. But not everybody is in covenant with God. Not everybody is in covenant with God. Like I can honestly say. That every person on this planet. Every human being is made in the image of God and is uniquely precious. But I am in covenant with a particular one. Okay? And, and so, if, if you're married, it's obvious that your spouse, in terms of relationships, that is your number one. After God. God first. And your spouse, your husband, your wife, is, your, is, your, is priority number one. That relationship. Everybody is equally valuable and valid, but not there's a covenant here. And so, 
for many people, and, and the New Testament shows it in, in the book of Ephesians, that it's possible to live as a stranger to your covenant. To not have a clue. You can be saved. Listen, you can be a Christian. Be saved from the wrath to come. And not have a clue what God in Christ has done for you. Yes, you have enough revelation to get you to heaven when you die. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Heaven and hell is real. And people, listen, people don't go to heaven because they're good or bad. Your eternal life is not so much based on whether you're good or bad. You go to heaven because you're alive. The gospel message is Christ makes dead people alive. Amen. There are basically, look, it's like this. In Adam, all die. In Christ, all are made alive. It's only people who, are spirit, who have been made spiritually alive. You've heard of the term born again. Who said of the term born again? Born again. In the New Testament Greek it says born from above. Born from above. Born of the spirit. Jesus said, listen, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. That which is born of the flesh does not go to heaven. Even if they've got Nobel Peace Prizes and every good amazing thing after their name. The only people that have eternal life are those who are regenerate. Who are born of the Spirit. Born of the Spirit. And in that new birth, we come into a covenant relationship with God. And Paul is expressing here at the beginning of Romans... That he has a calling on his life as an apostle to bring about an obedience of faith among pagans. Pagan Gentiles. People who have no knowledge of God whatsoever. He has a grace on his life. A calling from God to bring them to an obedience of faith. That's powerful. That's powerful. That's how powerful the gospel is. And it's for his name. It's for the name of Jesus. Okay. Often the gospel message. Listen. The gospel message is often presented for its benefits. There are many benefits. There are many wonderful benefits to make it Jesus your Lord. Many wonderful benefits. The addictions in your life will go. The pain in your heart will be healed. Amen. All of the, the, the things that the, the enemies done to you will be healed. Your marriage will be better if you put Jesus first in it. And yet, for all of the wonderful reasons why being a Christian does better your life, Ultimately, to be a Christian is not for those reasons. It's for his name. It's for his name. It's that the Lamb, Jesus is the Lamb of God, that the Lamb may have his reward. That he may have the reward of his suffering. He paid for you. He paid a price. And he is worthy. Jesus is worthy. To have our life laid at his feet. And if, if, basically, if, if we were to receive Jesus today and for the rest of our life, nothing good was to happen. He is worthy. He is worthy to have our life. He is worthy to, he's paid the price. And yet I'll tell you, when we do know him and follow him, our lives are transformed. Our lives are transformed. Amen. Well, let's follow Jesus because we love the truth. So, Paul has an anointing and a call on his life to bring about obedience to the faith. Now, let's go to the end of the book of Romans. In chapter 15. Now, if you know your Bible, 
you will know that the book of Romans in the New Testament is the, probably the richest book of Christian doctrine of what the faith is in the whole Bible. And so Paul has a commission to bring about obedience among pagan Gentiles, among godless people like the United Kingdom today. And so that's what he said in chapter 1. Now we're going to go to chapter 15 and we can see his modus operandi. I would be confused. We can see how this is brought about. So let's go to it. Romans chapter 15 verse 18. Romans chapter 15 verse 18. And Paul says, For I will not dare to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me to make the Gentiles obedient. So the Apostle Paul is saying, look, Christ has accomplished something through my life. Who here wants Christ to accomplish something amazing through their life? Come on. I want Christ to... What do I for me? You want Christ to accomplish something amazing through your life. And then, now a lot of the stuff out there is how to be a better me, how to have your best life ever. And that's all basically the self-help ego teaching of the spirit of this age. And yet if we embrace the will of God in the New Testament, we will have our best life ever. <laughs> Hallelujah. So he said, look, God, Christ has accomplished some amazing things through me to make the Gentiles obedient by word and deed. And in the next verse, he tells us how. He said, by the power of signs and wonders, by the power of the Spirit of God, so that from Jerusalem and as far around as Lycrium, I have fully preached the gospel of Christ. Who believes as a Christian, we should believe in a full gospel. A full gospel. The gospel is not a full gospel if there's not a supernatural manifestation. It's not. The gospel is not a full gospel without the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. And Paul says here, that by the power of the Spirit of God, these godless pagans, these Gentiles, were brought to obedience of the faith. Wow. Jesus said something amazing in Matthew eleven twenty three. 23. I might have to call back in at Romans, because that's just so powerful. In Matthew eleven twenty three. 23. Hallelujah. Let's just go there. I just want to. I just want to be in the Bible. You know, I've, I've used my tablet a lot, but I thought today I, I want. I want to be old-fashioned. Amen. Anyone want to be an old-fashioned Christian? Amen. Got my Bible. Okay, Matthew eleven twenty-three. Sorry, Matthew chapter eleven, from verse twenty. Jesus speaking began to reprimand. The cities where most of his mighty works were done. The word work there means miracles. Okay? Because they did not repent. He said, Woe to you, Chorazan, woe to you, Bethsaida, for if the mighty works which were done in you had been done in Tyra and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyra and Sidon on the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, who, ex who is exalted toward heaven, you will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works which have been, have been done in you had been done in Sodom, it would have remained until he's, he's reprimanded these cities where he was preaching and healing people and casting out demons. What are you, Corazon? What are you, Bethsaida? 
He said, have the miracles that were done in you being done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented. Had it happened in Sodom and Gomorrah, it would have remained. Can we say that? You know, I, I've, I've preached on the streets many a times and I've seen many street preachers who are, who are bringing the letter. Who are re- and I've preached on the streets a lot. I've preached with a microphone. I have. I have. I've seen the good, the bad and the ugly of that. <laughs> I've seen riots. But I've seen it done really wrong because people can stand there and bring the letter. Bring the letter. And condemn the people. Condemn the people. There has to be a flow of the Spirit. Paul is saying, come on, if we can just, let's all just be mature sons and daughters of God here. Because listen, this is a challenge because we're facing an impossibility here. We're we're touching the realm of the impossible right now. Because anybody, any one of us looking Look, please come next Saturday and evangelize. If all you feel confident to do, give out a leaflet, that's fine. I think, yeah, Billy Graham's mother received a leaflet. If that's all you can do, fine. But listen, we're touching the realm of the impossible. Stick with me. Because anybody, it doesn't take supernatural just to give a word only and tell people they're wrong and they're a sinner. And by the way, yes, I do believe it's a sin. I do. But there's a challenge here to step for the church, to step into the supernatural and manifest the Spirit of God. The Apostle Paul of the Corinthians said, the manifestation of the Spirit is given to all. That means every New Testament Christian can manifest the Spirit of God. That's what the gifts of the Spirit are for. They are to manifest Christ now. And Paul said, I went to Rome, a paganized culture, emperor worship. Bless Keir Starmer. He's not so popular. We have to pray for those in authority. But I think Nero was a little bit worse than uh, Tutia Keir. <laughs> And he's not going to be friendly towards Christians. This government isn't going to be. And it might do us good. We might find out who the real believers are in this next five years. Now, we're facing an impossibility because Paul said, Look, I came to a godless culture, a totally wicked godless culture. And I used the grace from the Spirit of God. I accessed the grace from the Spirit of God to bring godless pagans to obedience of faith. And this is how I did it. By the Spirit of God, through mighty signs and wonders, they were brought to obedience. And Jesus said, if the miracles that were done in Bethsaida and Chorazon had been done in Sodom and Gomorrah, it would have remained. Now that puts us in an uncomfortable position because we in the Western countries, we love knowledge because knowledge is power. But we have very little revelation. We've got information, no revelation. No revelation. When you get revelation, it has to come from God. God isn't interested how many letters we have after our name. Revelation comes from a a war with God. It doesn't come from human ability. And when the church carries revelation of the name of Jesus as for his name, then we will see people from the pagan godless culture out there. I don't want to go too much into one because it's a bit heavy duty theology. But he used the term total depravity. Look, bless you. You come to King of Kings Church this morning. I don't suppose you want to come to church to be told. In your natural self, you are totally depraved. I am. We all are. In your natural self. Totally and utterly depraved. 
Why else do you need Jesus? You don't need a self-esteem gospel. You need somebody to have his... You need God to become a man for his flesh to be ripped open. For his beard to be plucked out. For a crown of thorns to be pushed into his head so blood pours down. And you need him to be have nails put to his hands and feet. And for him to be nailed to a cross and die in your place. That's what you need. That's what I need. That's the gospel. But we need to get back to the raw, basic gospel. That's the gospel that saves. And this gospel is the gospel that brings about the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I'll show you very quickly. I, I, I've come today because I don't want to flow more. I don't want to be scripted. Go to Galatians 3. Very quickly, Galatians 3. Hallelujah. Glory be to God. Let's glorify the gospel. And I want to say publicly, anybody listening to this message on YouTube, anybody from the LGBT community, we are not, I'm not judging you. Jesus says, we're the love our neighbor is ourself. It says, oh foolish Galatians, who, listen, Galatians 3 verse 1. O oh, foolish Galatians, who hath bewitched you that you should not obey the truth? Before your eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed among you as crucified. So, here we see witchcraft in the church. The word bewitched occurs once in the New Testament, and it means to have witch. This means witchcraft is on the church. And when we talk about witchcraft, ooh, witchcraft, witchcraft, ooh, and yeah, I believe. But the real witchcraft that is spoken of here is any form of teaching or ideology that takes believers away from focusing on the cross. Who has bewitched you, Paul said? Jesus Christ was portrayed as crucified before you. You're getting off what Jesus did for you on the cross and you're getting into this other teachings, this other works, or you're getting into this self-help stuff. And Paul calls it witchcraft. St. Paul calls it witchcraft. Now he says, when you get back to the cross, this is what happens. Verse 5, he says, Does, listen, does God give you the Spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by the hearing of your faith? Stick with this. He says, look, when the cross was preached, it caused an outpouring of the Spirit and a work of miracles. So we've got to get back to the cross. When he preached the cross, when Jesus Christ is portrayed as crucified, the Spirit of God is poured out. Listen, in the New Testament Greek, I love it, it says this. He who constantly supplies the Spirit and constantly works miracles. Who wants a constant supply of the Spirit? I want a constant supply of the Holy Spirit, a constant work of miracles in the church. And so, the Apostle Paul said, when I came to a godless culture to make people obedient to Jesus Christ for his name, this is how I did it. I flowed in the Spirit of God. Through mighty signs and wonders, these people were brought to obedience. Jesus said the same thing. He said, look, had these miracles been done in Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have repented. Wow. That's challenging. And we could say, well, that is for them. And it doesn't really apply today. Well, that's called cessationism. And that's a lie. Because Jesus hasn't changed. Now we haven't got time, but if you made it up, the, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 2, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, he said, my preaching is not in word only. It's not about debating people. It's in a demonstration of the spirit and of power that your faith may not stand in the wisdom of man but in the power of God. Now, background. Paul had ministered in Athens. Athens 
was the center and the birthplace of Greek philosophy. It was a very intellectual city. And the Apostle Paul went there, and not many people came to the Lord there. If you read the account in Acts 13, oh sorry, Acts chapter 17. And what did Paul do when he was in Athens? He debated. He got in the debate and he got in the reason. In Acts chapter 18, he left Athens and came to Corinth. And in the second chapter of the Corinthian letter, he says, when I came to you, I came in fear and trembling. I felt inadequate. I'll, I'm not, it's just, take it as my theory. I think Paul came from Athens thinking, you know, I'm a very educated guy. I grew up under Gamiel. I've lost confidence in my debating ability. I've lost confidence in trying to preach a lot of reason, just a lot of words. I'm going to give myself over to the Holy Spirit now. I'm going to move in the power of God so that my preaching is not just in word only, but it's in the power of God. It's in a demonstration of the Spirit of power. So people's faith will not stand on the wisdom of man, on the sophos. The word wisdom is the word sophos, where we get the word so the name Sophie. The sophos, the Greek wisdom. Our Western culture, secular humanism of Europe, North America, the Western world comes from where? It comes from Greek philosophy. And Paul says, I'm not going to move in that. I'm not going to try and debate the people. I'm going to move in the spirit. I'm going to move in the power of the spirit. And that's what he did. Now quickly, if we, uh, uh, you know, let's go to Mark chapter 1. Mark's gospel. Chapter 1. Mark's gospel, chapter 1. I love the gospel of Mark. You can read it in just over 90 minutes. That's 90 minutes, well spent, much better than Netflix, much better than some distraction. Now, let's just have a, a snapshot through Mark's Gospel, chapter 1. So, in verse 14, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the Gospel of the Kingdom of God, saying, The time is fulfilled and the Kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the Gospel. Okay, does it stop there? He calls the first disciples. Okay, then go down to verse 21. They went to Capernaum, and on the Sabbath he entered the synagogue and taught. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, not as the scribes. They were just educated. Nothing wrong with education, but education without the Spirit is a hindrance. In their synagogue was a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried, Leave us alone. What do we have to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. <clears throat> You're the Holy One of God. Excuse me. Jesus said, Be silent. Come out of him. When the unclean spirit had convulsed him, he cried out with a loud voice and came out of him. They were all amazed. So the people in church, they said, this was church. They used to just a lecture. There used to church, it's just a lecture, it's just a talk. And all of a sudden, the power of God's unleashed. And they said, this guy's got authority. He has a command in his voice. Even the unclean spirits obey him. Praise God. Then, let's move on. He came out of the synagogue, went to the house of Simon and Andrew. The mother of Simon's wife lay sick with a fever. He came where he healed her. The fever left her. Verse 32. Is that verse 32? In the evening, when the sun had set, they brought to him all who were sick and those who were possessed with demons. The whole city was gathered at the door. Would you like to see the whole of the city? At the door of the church of Jesus Christ in this city. Who would like to see that? The whole city of Leeds. Now, should we say, if, the, if there's a supernatural explosion of the power of God in Leeds... And all the people of the city of Leeds are coming to the door of the church, figuratively speaking. Should we say, should we go and separate them? Well, not you, you, yeah, not you. Should we do that? 
No, -uh. we can't do that, can we? So they gathered at the door and he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. For some people, demons are something that only exists in Africa or Asia or in medieval times or in an insane asylum. No, demons are real. Don't magnify them. Don't glorify them. Okay, but Jesus healed all the sick and he cast out the demons and he did not let the demons speak. So Jesus did not put a microphone to the demon's mouth, to the person's mouth, okay? Just want to, just want to point that little one out there. Okay. So you get the picture. And then it says at the end, towards the end, he preached in the synagogues throughout Galilee and cast out demons. Casting out demons, evil spirits, was a big part of the ministry of Jesus. And then, moving on, the cleansing of the leper. He cleansed the leper. And at the end of chapter 1, um, Jesus, the, the leper went out and told everyone, and Jesus could no more openly enter the city. He was in remote places, and they came to him from everywhere. Who would like, if, if we went out into the Yorkshire Dales, and every from, everyone from out, every from in Leeds and Bradford drove out into the middle of the Yorkshire Dales National Park because they wanted a, a touch of God. You know? It's not convenient, is it? It's not good marketing for your church. But that's what, that's, this is what's happening. Why is this happening? Why? Because the Holy Spirit's moving. That's why. And we could say, well, that's just for them. That's not really for us now. But now, I've mentioned before, and I'm not here to bash people be negative. There's a teaching called cessationism that says all these things have stopped. It's a lie. There's no way in Scripture that supports that. Now, the vast majority of the church now would not say that they believe in cessationism. But, and I'm speaking and I feel the challenge myself, and this is the uncomfortable, this is the uncomfortable place. Because listen, I can no more raise the dead, heal somebody's broken back, than I can paint that sky green. Hello, if I said to you, please go outside and paint the sky green, you'd be like, I can't do that. You can no more open a blind eye than paint the sky green. You're like, come on, it's like, you've hit the limit and more of man's ability. But something has to happen. A people of God need to step out of man's ability and into God's ability and that's the revelation from God. Now, we have a problem because when you face the impossible, you face the sense of your own, our own, your own impotency. Being impotent. Being impotent. Being weak. That's the very thing that people run from. To step into the Holy Spirit is to come out from behind the bush and say, here I am. I want this God. Clothe me with power from above. Because look, if, if Jesus said in Mark, we read that in Mark chapter 1. This is what Jesus did. In Mark chapter 16, at the end of Mark, he said, from verse 13, he said, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. This, can we agree that all Christians were called to do that? We're called to preach the gospel. Amen? Amen. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. These signs will accompany those who believe in my name. So, let's finish here. If... Jesus came and preached the gospel, preached the, he preached the gospel of the kingdom. Then he went to the cross, 
He died. He was risen from the dead. Then he said, in my name, go and do this. Does he mean to go and do it? Yeah. Is it in your name or his name? If you work for a company and the CEO said, there's the company checkbook, do business in my name. Does he mean to do it or not? It's in his name. So this is a continuation. This means this hasn't ceased. And he says, in my name, these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will counsel demons. Help me. They will cast out demons. Church counsels demons. There's a place for counseling. There is a place for counseling. But we don't counsel demons. We eject them. We subjugate them in the name of Jesus and expel them from people, places, territories and things. So in my name they will drive out demons. They will speak with new tongues. If tongues is not for the day, this is another subject. Praying in the Spirit is vital to walking in the power of God. If praying in the Spirit is not for the day, then the name of Jesus has no authority. The name of Jesus is the greatest name in heaven, earth, and hell. So, in my name, they will cast out demons, they will speak in new tongues, they will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will not hurt them. Now, there's those crazy redneck churches in the backwoods of America where they pick up snakes. That's not what he means. He means as you go about preaching the gospel, you'll know supernatural protection. You'll have supernatural protection on your life. And he says you will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. You'll lay hands on the sick. So, we are in an area of impossibility because in ourselves we're impotent. We, have, we can no more heal the sick than we can paint the sky green. So we, in our own name, we can't do a thing. So we need revelation of the name of Jesus. Which is why he says in Philippians 2, God has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every other name. That at the name of Jesus every name should bow. Of those in heaven and earth and under the earth and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. In the Aramaic New Testament it says that all the tongues will say that Jesus Christ is Lord. I like that. It means every language. Jesus will be proclaimed as Lord in every language on the planet. That means there'll be a supernatural spread of the gospel. That means some of us have relatives who are hard, hard people. When, you, when we get a revelation of the name of Jesus Christ, some of those people are going to be, their knee is going to bow to Jesus as Lord. Well. Their tongue is going to confess that he is Lord. Now I just feel a stir to get back into the, to get into the impossible place. We can organize the church to death. We can have the best talks. We can have the best reasoning. But without the Holy Spirit, is dead. Hallelujah. Holy Spirit, I want to welcome you here now. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for your presence in this place. Holy Spirit, just close your eyes. Jesus is Lord. Let's declare together, Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus Christ is Lord. Kalamosi porati oramasi to rava masaku kemor kia. Jesus is Lord. God wants to just touch people today and heal.